guys we're back in the colony and as we left off before we're going to continue exploring the big forest while we're gonna talk about some gameplay um, we're gonna do an analysis on the gameplay in general in gothic so let's kick off with the beginning of the game so the beginning of the game basically reinforces the idea uh, the awesome idea by the way that you are not important you are not the chosen one you are not um, uh, the hero meant to save the world and all that jazz you're just a, a convict that's being sent to the colony and it's really cool that they do not give you a backstory and because they don't give you a backstory they actually allow you to Fill in the gaps however you want. You can be whatever you want. You can imagine the uh, Nameless Hero story however you want. And that's also his name, by the way. It's the Nameless Hero. So in this cave, by the way, there's nothing interesting except some mushrooms. Now, it's pretty uh, cool how the beginning of the game has you just sort of figuring out the rules of the prison you are in, exactly how you would normally um, uh, learn how to deal with life in prison. If you were to be sent to prison, your top priority would be to figure out what's what, who are the main factions, um, who are the main groups, uh, how to survive, what to do, what not to do. Uh, like in the first day in the colony, you will most likely be either attacked or um, you're gonna be asked for some protection money and stuff like that and it's small awesome details like that that really sell the story and reinforce it to you now let's talk about a few gameplay mechanics in the beginning now the game re uh, doesn't outright teach you that but you can cook food which is really important now this creature creature in the distance is called a shadow beast and shadow beasts are some of the strongest uh, enemies in the game now normally we can't actually take on a shadow beast by ourselves at this level we need to be very very careful on how we manage this fight because it actually takes us maybe a couple of hits to die due to a shadow be beast but remember you can abuse the um, iframes the invincibility frames if you really want to take on the shadow beast uh, using melee now one option may, might not be the best option though uh, is to actually no it's a good option I'll rephrase that. It's a good option. So, we can clear this side of this small uh, canyon over here. I'm just gonna clear some low-level mobs so they don't, don't actually bother us. I'm gonna leave those blood flies in the distance for now. Now, our main goal is to simply clear a few mobs here so we get a good vantage point. So we can snipe the Shadow Beast using our longbow. Now the Shadow Beast is extremely strong, it has high armor. So a longbow won't actually do any damage, any standard damage uh, per arrow. You're gonna need... Oh, it actually scared me. You're actually gonna need critical shots to do that. Okay, so nothing else over here. Eh, just a wolf. A couple of wolves. Okay, so back to gameplay mechanics. Uh, you can do minimal stuff like uh, cook some food, although the game gives you so much, um, so many resources like uh, healing plants, healing herbs, um, food you can get from chests and NPCs. You can find the occasional healing scroll or potion. And really, you're not going to be hurting for um, for healing in the game unless you are 
uh, really clunky at fighting, which can be, you can be, and that's not necessarily your fault because the combat is janky. And uh, it takes, <clears throat> it does take a while to get used to it. Now, what do we have here? Another blood fly. And it's okay if you end up taking a lot of damage uh, throughout the game because it's, huh, this blood fly actually died somewhere in the tree and we can't actually loot it because of that. That sometimes happen. So, talk about janky stuff. Now, we're gonna try to climb this. Yes, it worked. Now, here comes the tricky part, the really, really tricky part. Because we have acrobatics. Okay, we made it. Now, we wanna snipe this shadow beast while we're standing on this tree branch, but you have to be careful when you're fighting because each time you pop an arrow, the character would slightly move backwards and you can actually see with each shot that he inches backwards just a bit. Now, we only need a few critical shots to take this shadow beast down. Now, ideally, this happens before the character backs down so much because you can actually fall if you misposition yourself. Now, I think one more shot should do it. Okay, so that's 400 experience points for one Shadow Beast. That's a lot of experience points and we're happy about that. Fell a bit, took some damage, doesn't really matter. Now, what does it have? It has the skin of a Shadow Beast, quite valuable, some teeth and some meat. Now, I hear a blood fly aggroing me somewhere and I think it's one of these blood flies. I'm just gonna climb up here, take them out, okay. Now, the reason I specifically want to clear the whole map, well, as much as the whole map as possible in the first chapter, is because many enemies will respawn, but they will respawn something like 30% of uh, the mob density across the map. So, for example, if you have uh, something like six scavengers in one pack, you'll only see a couple of scavengers respawn. Now, this is done to maintain a, uh, maintain a source of, uh, a sense of immersion when it comes to uh, ecological density, I guess, so it feels like you're not wiping out the whole ecosystem. Although, personally, I kind of like uh, and I kind of enjoy the idea of just uh, wiping out the entire map, gaining experience for it. Because it's... it's it's pretty satisfying feeling to know that you can move from point A to point B without getting attacked because you know you cleared the entire map beforehand. I'm not a fan of games where I have to clear uh, a cave 50 times over or a highway 50 times over again and again, especially in games where respawn timers are unreasonably fast. Like, for example, uh, I played Fallout 3 and New Vegas, and by the way, New Vegas is the best, next to Fallout 1 and 2. Um, using a mod called uh, Long Respawn Timer, which basically sets the respawn timer to something like uh, 50 years, so enemies don't really respawn, uh, except with minor, uh, except in minor places and a few situations. And the reason I do that is because I really don't fancy the idea after, for example, I wipe out an entire cave of uh, ghouls. Suddenly you have 20 ghouls there living uh, a few days later. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Or if it's not ghouls, let's say robots or uh, mutants or whatever you want to insert there. You can insert whatever uh, mob you'd like. Now, let's go back to mechanics. So yeah, uh, Gothic 1 and 2, and to an extent even 3, don't have respawning enemies, which honestly I think it was a good design choice, because the map is not very big. Now, you might get a sense while we're playing that the map is pretty big, but it's not, it's really not. However, it is uh, handmade, it is tailored, it's... Uh, handcrafted quite um, with a lot of attention to detail 
it's not procedurally generated like a lot of devs use uh, procedurally generated maps today because it simply um, allows you to save on development resources by simply using algorithms to make your map and I can understand the justification behind it however you can feel that maps get sort of repetitive or uh, uninspired or bland or something like that uh, and that's why I loved Gothic 1 and 2 after so many years of playing games I still come back to them and they made more good design decisions than bad overall in my humble opinion and one of those good design decisions was to not have respawning enemies every five minutes now let's go back to gameplay so what gameplay options do you have in the game you can forge stuff which is cool uh, forging is basic in the game so let's be honest about that you can only make crude swords and it makes sense because you really are not a smith now they expanded that in gothic 2 where you can make various types of swords and smithing is actually a profession you learn now the good part about smithing in Gothic 2 is that you can actually make money from it, uh, a lot of money. Because you can't just make uh, crude swords, you can learn various recipes throughout the game. You, you, you will have a tutor, you will have a spoiler alert, you will have a dedicated trainer for smithing. A couple of them actually. Now that's smithing. It's nice that you can, for example, use a trick we used in the first few episodes to lockpick the chest near Huno, the black blacksmith, to uh, get some quick uh, raw steel so we can forge some swords, which allowed us to buy good armor in the beginning. And that good armor in the beginning is actually more important than you think. Now, um, let's talk about stuff like armor. Now, the way armor works in Gothic, gameplay-wise, is that it's a flat reduction it's not a percentage reduction so for example scavengers uh, don't do a lot of damage obviously because they're low level mobs scavengers and stuff like mole rats are pretty benign in the game they're uh, low level mobs that you encounter pretty much everywhere but what armor does is for example let's say you have 20 armor and a scavenger does 20 damage so what the game does is subtract the damage from the armor to a um, maximum of one point of damage. So if your armor is exactly on the same level as the damage or higher than you take, uh, you are only going to take one damage point, which is pretty nice because it kind of makes sense. Like in real life, if you'd be clad in full plate armor, you will not take a whole lot of damage from something as, I don't know, a uh, dog bite, I guess, if you would have uh, gauntlets and uh, van braces and epaulets and uh, a gorget, breastplate, plate leggings, sabatons and all that jazz, you would not take a lot of damage from uh, the bite of a dog, right? And at best, you might take some impact damage in the sense that maybe the dog knocks you down or uh, uh, something like that. I mean, it's, it makes sense to take only one point of damage just because the game decides that you should take the situation a bit seriously, but not that seriously. So that's basically how armor works. Now, one thing that... Uh, I'm not a fan of in Gothic 1 is that uh, certain damage types are way 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 more dangerous than others. So the most common damage types you will encounter throughout the game are gonna be weapons and arrows. If people start shooting you with a bow obviously you'd want high arrow protection, right? If, but most animals and uh, NPCs will just do impact damage with weapons. So that's basically how armor works in Gothic. It's uh, a flat reduction and all um, NPCs and monsters are carefully edited to do as much damage as um, it would make sense for them to do. Now, 
here's a little interesting part now this this uh, I don't want to call it a shrine it's um, <clears throat> how do we call this it's not let's say it's um, it's a focus point actually I think that's the correct lore term it's a focus point now this will be uh, important in later on in the story and if I remember right, in the intro video, you can actually see this focus point where the magicians place their staffs to create the barrier. Now you can see in the distance, this is the ocean and this uh, basically tells you that the east side of the... And you can actually see it on the map, the east side is basically where the island ends on the... Valley of Mines. The colony, as I said, is also called the Valley of Mines because it's basically shaped like a valley and it is a valley. Now this is basically just a way to the swamp camp and down there you can actually see part of the temple courtyard. There is nothing of interest if you go uh, down there uh, on this route. So we're gonna keep finishing, uh, we're gonna keep exploring the big forest we have. And I think we can actually pop uh, a few speed potions, why not, because it's gonna save us some time. We looted some speed potions from the old camp, which is pretty nice. So I have my telekinesis spell active, by the way, because I want to see if I'm missing any plants or any items along the road. Or should I say along the forest? Okay, so back to gameplay. Now, Pirani Bites, you should know that they had... Um, a team of about half a dozen people when they make Gothic 1. So that's not a lot of people, it was a small studio, but they had great ambitions and you can see that they tried to do stuff like alchemy and um, uh, and my cat is staring uh, very confused at me and he's wondering why I'm talking to myself, but I'm actually talking to you guys. <laughs> I'm probably gonna put a video of my cat at some point or another because he's a really cool smart cat way too smart for his own good. <laughs> um, I also walk him like a dog, by the way. So, yeah, I have one of those rare breeds of cats. Uh, uh, didn't bought him, I actually simply adopted him from the streets, and apparently I adopted, without knowing, a Norve Norwegian forest cat. Uh, I, I wasn't really a cat expert when I adopted him, I sort of became one over time. <laughs> Now, yeah, and yeah, I basically adopted a very intelligent Norwegian forest cat who loves to be walked every night. And he actually behaves like a husky in the sense that he's a drama queen if he doesn't get his uh, evening walks. Now, back to... Okay, why am I still sprinting? Okay. Sorry to ruin the party, guys. Okay. So gameplay wise, it's clear that they wanted to add stuff like alchemy because they bothered to code items like mercury and alcohol and flasks and stuff like that. But it's also obvious that they didn't have the budget to do it. I mean, um, the engine of Gothic is, uh, it was made by them, so it wasn't a pre-existing engine. Back then, by the way, pretty much almost all development companies or at least uh, the good ones uh, tended to make their own game engines because there wasn't a lot on the market uh, during those days. It's not like uh, these days where you have Unity and uh, half of the game these days uh, seem to be made in Unity because it's it has a vast library of stuff and assets, I agree. And it can be pretty easy to get into compared to other game engines, I guess. And Unity does allow you to make a lot of stuff. Now... Uh, Gothic 1 took about 4 years into development, more or less. 3 to 4 years. And it was uh, published by Joe Wood. Joe Wood saw potential in Piranha Bytes. And uh, they made a good call by supporting them. Now let's kill these blood flies. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Alright, so gameplay. Alchemy, unfortunately, is not a thing in the game. Not in Gothic 1. It is in Gothic 2, and it's nice that they do expand the system. Uh, 
but we're gonna talk about that in Gothic 2 when we get there eventually. And after Gothic 1 I'll do a preview of the game and then we're gonna start playing Gothic 2, the Night of the Raven. <laughs> the tomb. And I'm really freaking excited for that because Gothic 2 is my, uh, one of my favorite games and I'll be honest with you, I think I played that game about 17 times throughout my life. I think I play it once a year to be honest just for uh, nostalgia because I, I keep going back to it every time I uh, try a new RPG or a new game a lot of them tend to make a, a lot of design mistakes that sort of make me just go back to gothic too and remind myself just how um, how many things were uh, how many good things were done in the game now going back to gameplay so gothic one also did a revolutionary thing which was and i do say <clears throat> uh, sorry i do say revolutionary in the sense that it wasn't really done until then because it was pretty expensive and that was full voice acting now there were games that had full voice acting like half-life and so on but not to the amount of man hours it actually uh, takes in recordings to fully voice act all the dialogue lines in a game. Now, games, for example, back then like Planescape Torment or Lionheart Legacy of the Crusader or Arcanum or Fallout, even then they recognized that full voice acting tended to be pretty expensive. And it was because you could uh, have something like uh, 60 hours of, of full voice recording and those hours uh, this is a bug yeah I think we have an inter no are we okay okay had a minor interface bug right there no biggie yeah, okay so yeah gothic one really was ahead of its curve for a lot of reasons now another reason was that NPCs actually behave uh, within a schedule and I don't and I'm gonna bash Bethesda a bit on this one I I think Radiant AI is very bad and I really like that they made um, uh, handmade scripts for all NPCs like when they go to bed when they wash their faces when they eat when they drink uh, when they move around the camp uh, when they have uh, banter with each other when they talk to each other when they um, train with their swords, and stuff like that. Now, individually, all of those things are not all that amazing, but together they they end up uh, creating an experience that's greater than the sum of its parts. Now, one of the things that I really love, and it's, uh, it actually boggles my mind to this day, that Gothic 1 did so well it was the level of immersion, and I think a lot of things contributed to that immersion. One of them was just how simple the interface is and the UI in general. Now, the UI is basically just three elements. You have your inventory, which is not obtrusive. It doesn't cover the entire screen like a lot of games do these days. You have your character sheet. Now, because we're playing the um, patch version, you can see that uh, a lot of it is transparent. And uh, Vanilla Gothic, you'd have a blue background uh, behind your character sheets for easy readability. And uh, you also have your quest journal, which pretty much is exactly what you'd think it is. The hero, the nameless hero, always uh, jots down his thoughts and ideas and important details about quests about where he should go, what he should do, uh, who should uh, he talk to, and so on. Now, immersion-wise, Gothic, I think, uh, was a great success because also of its audio design, and again, we have to remind ourselves that Kai Rosenkrantz was the genius behind that. Like, he was uh, 17 when he did the audio design, and you can tell that he was pretty talented back then. And on now on this bridge, we're gonna find some black goblins. Now I think we can actually kill these black. I'm not sure. We can probably kill these black goblins with a fireball. 
Okay, so we can actually individually handle all the goblins with fireballs because and this is an AI in a way uh, an AI uh, issue that um, goblins don't react to you killing their buddies they fix that in gothic 2 as I said uh, piranha bites learned a lot from their mistakes in gothic 2 um, and they really upgraded uh, the game experience okay I think this is the last one Let's see. Are we right? I think we're right. So these black goblins, this place over here actually is a quest place. It's um, it's a quest later on you'll do. I think maybe in chapter two or three. Can't really recall when it happens. Maybe three. Now this cave over here is a pretty dangerous cave because it has a lot of goblins inside of it. Now, one way to manage this fight is you can try to climb up here, just as we did, and you can try to sort of lead the goblins back here, back on this side of the outcropping, this rocky ledge. Now, if you're lucky, you can actually manage a, a running walk like this, and you can quickly get up here. Uh, the goblins will obviously try to climb, and some of them might manage to climb. Now, let's see if we can snipe a couple of goblins quickly. Because there are a lot of goblins in the cave, and the moment one goblin aggroes you, all of them will end up aggroing you. And I think there is about 20 goblins in total. And that's a whole lot of goblins. This is basically a goblin paradise right here. Now, even if we have good armor like we do right now, okay, I think this one is gonna aggro us. Okay, so they eventually aggroed us as we suspected. Now we're gonna quickly try to get up here. We're gonna try to snipe them with our bows. Individually, they don't do a lot of damage, but when 20 of them manage to swarm you, uh, they can whittle down your health pretty quickly. Okay. I think that one is stuck. Okay, not a danger. And we're just going to try to slowly whittle down their numbers as much as we can. Okay, I think there's a couple of left. We can actually handle these guys in melee. And I remember one of them being over there, and another one is stuck over there. Now, let's try to kill this guy over here. Okay. Now, it might be that we actually take only one point of damage because our armor is so high, but I simply don't want to risk it. These goblins, as I said, you should, you should never underestimate enemies in, underestimate enemies in uh, large numbers in Gothic. And, yep, there are still goblins around. Now, there's this guy here that's stuck. And you can actually see he's on fire and he has a burning animation. Now, let's try to... <clears throat> I wasn't even trying to avoid him, but just got lucky there. Do we hear any more goblins? I don't think we have any more goblins around. Now, we finished exploring the big forest, by the way. Which is great. Uh, there are a couple of more... Yep, more goblins. Let's quickly charge this guy. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's... Uh... The only thing of note they really have are their nail clubs. Now, let's go back to talking a bit of, uh, about gameplay. So, yeah, audio design. Uh, the game does a wonderful job at audio design. When you're near a waterfall, you actually feel you are near a waterfall. When you're in the forest at night, it actually feels scary. When you're in the swamp, you uh, hear crickets and uh, birds and uh, uh, toads and... Um, 
frogs and insects and stuff like that. The audio design is incredibly immersive, it's realistic, and Gothic 2 does an even better job at that. Okay, so what are gameplay mechanics we can talk about? Uh, oh yeah, you can rest. The fact that you have not just a day and night cycle, which was uh, pretty uh, emergent back in those days. Not a lot of games actually had a day and night cycle back then because it was pretty uh, complicated and difficult to do because you had to uh, basically uh, handcraft every uh, script for that. Now here we have just some simple loot. Now eventually we are going to go back to this cave because it has this almanac but we're not gonna loot the almanac just yet we're gonna come back here way later in uh, chapter two or three because a quest will take us here now the reason i wanted to clear this uh, specific cave was for the experience and um the only goblins that will actually respawn here are a few goblins on the bridge here <clears throat> so that's no biggie now, gameplay. So what else can you do in the game? You can cook food, you can do a bit of basic smithing, you can sleep to recover your health and mana, and to advance the time to certain points in the day where you might want to talk to a specific NPCs, because, uh, again, they do have routines. They do have... If you want to talk to Forrest, for example, at night he's going to go to bed in the castle, so you can't talk to him. Okay, uh, what are... Oh, yeah! A cool thing Gothic did, and pretty much no other game has done. Now, this area might seem a bit creepy, uh, but it's actually empty right now because there are no enemies or mobs around here. There are. This is a minor spoiler alert. You might want to fast forward 10 seconds. Now, this creepy area is actually an orcish cemetery, which is a great bit of environmental storytelling since that it tells us a bit about orcish culture. If they do have a cemetery, it means that they have respect for their dead, which is, by the way, uh, what's considered one of the uh, uh, key turning points in our evolution, the moment we decided burying our dead, was uh, considered a huge anthropological leap and human evolution because it meant we actually cared about the dead we actually cared about their lives they had meaning to us so small detail about orcish culture they are not as brutish and dumb as violent as they seem so they do seem to have uh, care for the dead which means they also have care for the living Okay, so we're actually gonna go back to the old uh, mountain fort because we want to finish clearing it out. Simply for the experience points, we there aren't many things left in the mountain fort. By the way, there are only a few harpies left and a few surprise skeletons. So we're gonna end the video exactly as we get to the fort, kill a few harpies. Now, one thing I really want to touch on is that Gothic overall as a game is not a huge game, doesn't take a lot to do. You'll find out that uh, the pacing of the game is uh, not that uh, well designed. And again, this was Piranha Bytes first major game, so we can be sort of forgiving with them for that. They did take a lot of lessons to heart when it came to pacing and uh, narrative pacing. Because a lot of the content in Gothic 1 you're going to do in Chapter 1. And I don't really mean the way I'm doing it right now. I mean, in general, how you are... Most of the quests will be in Chapter 1. Uh, a lot of the areas you'll visit will be in Chapter 1. And we also have a skeleton. Hello, Mr. Skeleton. Okay, anything else? Anybody else? Now we're level 17 and I think we're gonna reach level 18 by the end of chapter 1, which is really great for us because we, again, we want to save up as many skill points as we can. Now let's eat some, I think we can eat some raven herbs maybe? Do we have any... I distinctly remember having some raven herbs that... 
restored mana. So what are the Raven Herbs? Flame form, healing, Raven Herbs. Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna end the video right here. You know, past these cobwebs. Now, most of the stuff we're gonna do in chapter one, but the reason I want to do this is because when we're going to do the uh, main quest later on from chapter 2 onwards, uh, we're going to do it pretty fast because that's all the content that will be uh, story-wise. There will be some plot twists and adventures along the way, but when it comes to actually clearing the map, we, we will have done this beforehand so we don't have to really do it again. Uh, you can play the way you want to play though, so if you simply want to follow the quest line, uh, it's perfectly okay, the game uh, accounts for that. So if you just want to do the Test of Fate for Diego and you want to um, uh, join a camp then, like Swamp Camp or the New Camp or the Old Camp, and then just do the main quest, you, you can perfect, perfectly do it that way. There isn't anything game breaking, breaking about doing that, I simply wanted to do it do it this way because it's also uh, a challenge to clear the map in the first chapter and I kind of like playing games with a bit of a challenge to them that's why I like Gothic 1 and Gothic 2 so much. Now we're gonna end the video right here in the next video we're gonna explore the mountain fortress and we're gonna explore that sunken tower in the distance the tower on the lake right there now, that tower is going to uh, hold some nice secrets for us, and I think in the next video we'll probably finish exploring the entirety of the map. That's right folks, we've pretty much explored most of the map at this point. As I said, Gothic 1 is not a huge game, but you can actually feel it's handcrafted. Now, we're going to end the video right here, so I want to thank you guys for watching. I want to wish you guys a wonderful day, and if by chance it's going to be one of those bad days for you, I want to wish you the strength and wisdom to overcome it. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, I hope this video helped in relieving a part of your uh, stress or making the day just a tad better. If you want to help support the channel, you would be amazing if you do that, because it's a new channel. You can um click the link buy me a coffee in the video description to support the channel with as much as you can but if and if you don't that's perfectly okay because i'm gonna put out content for you guys for free because i really like good stories and rpgs and want to share them with you so cheers guys and until next time take care of yourselves